September 25th, 1066, was a hot day. The Vikings, worn out by the unusually warm autumn sun, camped at Stamford Bridge in the north of England, waiting for some hostages from York. To their own surprise, in the distance, they saw a large army approaching from York. It could only be the enemy, the 12,000th English army led by King Harold Godwinson. The year 1066 turned out to be an uneasy year for England and its newly crowned King Harold Godwinson, taking the throne upon the death of the previous ruler, Edward the Confessor, immediately had to defend his rights to the throne in a confrontation with two powerful rivals, William of Normandy and King Harold Hardrada of Norway. The latter was invited to take part in the struggle for the throne by the brother of the King of England, Tostig Godwinson, who had previously been expelled from the country and was aching now to reoccupy his old possessions and take revenge on his relatives. As an experienced warrior who had passed through many battles, Harold Hardrada fully sensed the danger of his position. His army did not gear up for the fight ahead, and many warriors left their chainmails in camp. In addition, the army was divided into two parts. There were about 6,000 warriors in the bridge area, and 3,000 warriors guarded the ships 15 miles south from there. The Vikings, who were not expecting a battle, scattered about the area in search of cattle. They had to be immediately gathered and hold their ground until the guards of the ships arrived. The bridge was the only place that could blunt the attack of the English warriors. A Viking detachment lined up there, ready to deliver a battle to the superior enemy. It's not known for certain whether that was done by order of the King of Norway or whether a group of warriors following the call of military honor and military fraternity decided to sacrifice their own lives for the sake of their friends. Or perhaps it was a straggling detachment that didn't have time to cross the bridge and decided to deliver the last battle and go to Valhalla with honor. Coming up to the bridge, the English warriors attacked the heroic detachment with superior forces. The Vikings fiercely fought back from the advancing enemy, but the forces were not equal. Besides, many warriors had no chainmail and huskerel axes, found gaps in the shield wall, and inexorably thinned out the ranks of the defenders. It remains unclear why the Vikings took a position in the front of and not behind the bridge because in this case, they could level out the numerical superiority of the enemy to some extent, as the Greeks did at the Battle of Thermopylae. After holding out for some time, the remnants of the Vikings retreated across the bridge. In the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of the 12th century, there's a mention of a warrior of huge stature, who alone, fighting on the bridge, blocked the English army's way and contained the enemy for some time, while killing 40 of the enemy. It sounded like a miracle, as the English had many archers who would simply stuff the hero with arrows like a pillow full of pins. After the Herald's army crushed the resistance, they began to cross the bridge, which greatly slowed down the movement of the warriors. Harold Hardrada could take advantage of the opportunity and stage a strike on the enemy, but probably his army had not yet concentrated by that time. Both troops gradually gathered, lining up in a soldierly array. It's not known exactly where the battle took place. Some historians believe that the Vikings lined up 400 yards from the bridge. There was a small hill, but it had a very mild slope, only about 15 feet high, and did not give any advantage to the defending army. Others believe that the battle took place 800 yards from the bridge on a plain bearing the name Battle Flat. There was also no exact data on the dispositions of the warring armies. According to some sources, the Vikings occupied all-around defense, probably to level out the numerical superiority of the enemy or to protect themselves from the cavalry. Although again, it's impossible to say for sure whether the English warriors fought in this battle on horseback because at that time, the Anglo-Saxon army preferred to fight on foot and horses were used only to move around. With high probability, 
it can only be argued that the Vikings lined up according to their custom, like a shield wall. The armies took up positions opposite each other, like two lions, stripping for action before the battle for supremacy over the pride. A small group of horsemen advanced from the English side and signaled that they wished to negotiate. It was King Harold Godwinson with his bodyguards. He asked to call his brother Tostig. Harold offered the olive branch in exchange for the territories that had been formerly owned by Tostig. Your words now are different from the humiliation and insults with which you lashed out at me last winter. If you had offered it at that time, many people would have saved their lives and England would have been in a better state. If I now accept your terms, what will you offer to King Harold Sigurdsson in exchange for his efforts that he had to spend? Tostig asked, to which the famous answer followed, seven feet of earth or a little more, since he's taller than the others. Tostig refused to accept these terms and betray the King of Norway. Not many things are known about the course of the battle. The sources and data are not accurate and contradictory. Someone believes that the Vikings rushed to the attack in an attempt to stun the enemy and throw them into the river. But most likely, they lined up with a shield wall and took up an all-around defense so that the numerically superior enemy did not go around their flanks. Harold Hadrata sent runners to the guards of the ships, demanding that they come as soon as possible. So that probably took a few hours. The English numerical superiority would not be so significant, and there would be a chance to win a decisive victory. The Vikings had to hold out for that period of time whatever it took, and then the assistance troops that came up could suddenly attack the English from the backside and put the enemy to flight, which was quite real, given that a significant part of the Anglo-Saxon army consisted of landowner militia, furred, and had no battle experience. Harold Hardrada, who fought in many battles in the past, including on the side of Kievan Rus and the Byzantine Empire, perfectly realized how important the personal example of a military leader was at a critical juncture in the battle. The Viking army had to fight without their chainmail with a numerically superior, well-armed enemy. Professional warriors, Huskarls, armed with deadly two-handed axes, fought in the front of the ranks of the English army. One accurate blow, even not very strong, easily knocked an unprotected enemy out of action. Despite the fierce resistance that had always distinguished the Northerners, their ranks gradually melted under the blows of the enemy. In order to inspire confidence in his warriors, Harold Hardrado plunged into the thick of the battle, furiously striking out right and left. However, a blind chance or a disposition of providence made its own amendments to the course of the battle. A random arrow hit the King of Norway in the throat and he collapsed to the ground, choking in his own blood. Tostig took the lead of the Viking army and continued the battle. In one of the pauses in the fighting when both sides were taking a breath, Harold Godwinson again offered the olive branch to his brother, but he did not agree, perhaps seeing in the distance the long-awaited reinforcements. 3,000 Vikings from the guards of the ships. Those warriors, who had every notion of the seriousness of the situation, hurried to the battlefield without sparing themselves. After they had run in their heavy chainmail most of the way, they were completely exhausted. Many of them suffering from the heat threw their armor along the road. Approaching the battlefield and seeing what a difficult situation their friends were in, the Vikings immediately rushed into the battle, trying to turn the battle in their favor. However, Many of them were so exhausted after a long run under the hot sun that they threw down their shields that had become unbearably heavy, and grabbing weapons with both hands fiercely cut into the ranks of the English, not caring about their own lives. Thereafter, many were found lifeless on the battlefield without getting a scratch as they died from over-fatigue. Despite the Herculean efforts of the Northerners, 
the arrival of reinforcements did not have a significant impact on the course of the battle. They were too few and they came too late, incredibly tired and exhausted. Finally, the advantage of the English in equipment and ground force manpower began to take a toll. The thinned ranks of the Vikings wavered, and in the late afternoon after the death of Tostig, the remnants of the army fled. The English warriors pursued the enemy, sparing no one. Only a small part of the Vikings managed to escape. Only 24 from the 300 ship flotilla came back. Despite the disadvantage of ground force manpower, the victory was not easy for the Anglo-Saxon army. The winners lost about 5,000 warriors. The losses of the Vikings were estimated at seven to 8,000. After the battle, Harold Godwinson turned his army south and met the Duke of Normandy halfway. The King of England had to go through another serious test. Thank you for watching it. If you liked the video, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to leave a comment, express your opinion about this battle.